we are going to start with colorectal cancer now. And uh, we will, it's not a very long lecture. The, in this lecture, there are a lot of slides that are for your reference only. So I'll go quickly through those slides. And uh, if we are not able to complete this lecture today, then we will uh, again come to the to this lecture. Uh, whatever part is left, we will complete that next week, all right? So uh, colorectal cancer, in this diagram, you see the uh, colon and you see a cancer that is over here. It could be there in the left side of, the, of, this, uh, of the colon or on the right side of the colon. On the left side and right side, we have molecularly different cancers most of the times, okay? So we'll see in this lecture that uh, what is colon cancer and what is the treatment of colon cancer. So colon cancer is the most common type of GI cancer. It is a multifactorial disease process with etiology encompassing genetic factors, environmental exposures, including diet and inflammatory bowel disease. You have done inflammatory bowel disease perhaps in previous uh, therapeutic lectures and also in pathophysiology, uh, particularly um, uh, this um, ulcerative colitis has is a very high risk factor for uh, colorectal cancer, okay? Then um, genetic factors, there, is a, there are a series of mutations that occur before colorectal cancer develops and we'll take a look at, at those mutations as well. And obviously, and by environmental exposures, here it is written diet, there are certain types of diets which uh, uh, put a person at a high risk of colorectal cancer and those are low fiber diets particularly meat, red meat, uh, is a high risk for colorectal cancer. Uh, a high fiber diet uh, actually protects against colorectal cancer. Surgery is currently the definitive treatment modality, but again, we do surgery in certain uh, stages, the localized diseases, we do surgery over there. Uh, but the prognosis is good, at least much, much better than the lung cancer. We have other therapeutic options who are not surgical candidates, and that includes, as usual, it will include uh, cryotherapy, radiofrequency ablation, ablation, again, which is a sort of radiotherapy, and uh, hepatic arterial infusion of uh, chemotherapeutic agents, or we can give uh, chemotherapy through uh, the normal routes that we usually do through a port A catheter, okay? Background invasive colorectal cancer is a preventable disease. Uh, there is uh, screening that we can do. It is recommended. And one of the screening tests, which uh, is uh, blood in stools, you know, it is known as occult blood in stools, blood that cannot be seen in high risk patients. We can do that test. Okay, it is a non invasive test. Uh, early detection through Though through widely applied screening programs is the most important factor in recent decline of colorectal cancer. And uh, biologic and genetic factors are being employed in clinics to assess the risk of developing colorectal cancer. So there are certain mutations. Sometimes there are certain familial diseases which predispose a person to a very high risk of colorectal cancer. And and one of those diseases, which is known as adenomatous polyposis coli, uh, it uh, has a 100% chance of transforming to a uh, cancer in the colon, all right? So these biologic and genetic factors are there. There has been an unprecedented advance in systemic therapy of colorectal cancer that has dramatically improved outcomes. But again, you know, the basic therapy, you know, uh, the backbone of the therapy is 5 fluorouracil and we combine it with leucovorine and we give uh, cisplatin, carboplatin as well, irinotecan. We have got certain um, protocols that I'll show you. And in this lecture, you'll also have to memorize uh, the 
the acronyms for certain protocols, and I'll show them to you in the coming slides. New agents will likely translate into improved cure rates for patients with early disease, stage two and stage three, and prolonged survival for stage four. Now, stage one disease, they say, is curative by surgery alone. Okay, but uh, again, it depends, okay? Locally advanced disease, most of the times we do surgery and the surgery is followed by chemotherapy, which is known as adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, pathophysiology, it's for your reference only. There are certain uh, genetic alterations or you can say a series of genetic alterations that lead to the development of colorectal cancer. So they're often associated with progression from pre-malignant lesion, which is an adenoma, to invasive adenocarcinoma. Uh, the types of uh, stepwise mutations, uh, all of them may not be present, but you know what happens is that one mutation occurs and after a few years, another mutation could occur in the same cell. And after a few years, a third mutation could occur in the same cell. So these mutas, mut mutations are accumulating in a stepwise fashion. And after many, many years, when sufficient number of mutations uh, are there in a cell, it will become cancerous and it, its division uh, will be out of control. Okay, It will start dividing in an uncontrollable fashion. So number one is mutation of APC gene. It is known as adenomatous polyposis coli gene. This is an early event, but just the mutation of APC gene does not cause cancer. It may lead to the for formation of adenoma, a pre-malignant lesion, but it does not cause cancer. But this, if followed by KRAS mutation, which is uh, the case uh, on many occasions in colorectal cancer, then you know we are now uh, moving towards developing a cancer. Then chromosome 18, loss of heterozygosity. You know, loss of heterozygosity means, you know, everyone has got two similar homologous chromosomes, one from the mother and the other from the father. So, and both these homologous chromosomes have got the same genes, right? But those two genes, the gene from father and the gene from mother are different genes. They are heterozygous genes. If we lose a gene from one of the chromosomes, that is known as uh, heterozygosity, which means you lose a gene or a segment of a homologous chromosome. And on the other chromosome, you have that gene, okay? So that is loss of heterozygosity. And then the next mutation. So you see the series of mutations, first APC gene, then KRAS oncogene, then loss of heterozygosity, or there could be a mutation in DCC gene. Okay, this is a tumor suppressor gene. Uh, this is an oncogene. This is also a tumor suppressor gene. This DCC, you know, these genes have got uh, strange names. Uh, and These names come from either viruses or some lower uh, organisms. So it means deleted in colorectal cancer. Uh, chromosome seven depletion affecting P53 tumor suppressive gene. So, you know, one after the other, the mutations are occurring. And eventually when we have sufficient number of mutations, then the person gets the cancer, okay? Then deficient DNA mismatch repair gene, Okay, leading to mutations of uh, these certain mel melanocyte stimulating hormone, whatever these are, okay, you don't have to memorize those names. But what I'm trying to tell you is that there are a number of mutations when all of them are present, not all of them, even if three or four of them are present, then that leads to cancer. And if the more, the number of mutant genes, the more aggressive the cancer is going to be. And this is another phenomenon which is known as microsatellite instability. And um, I will not explain that to you because you have not done genetics, but just uh, in, in one sentence, I can tell you that microsatellite regions are those regions on the DNA which uh, repeat themselves many times, right? There are five or six uh, nucleotides 
that go on repeating themselves 50 times or 100 times or whatever number of times. So microsatellite instability means that the number of repetitions are changing. Okay, <clears throat> so this is what happens, you know. Let us suppose you initially get a mutation in e APC gene. So you see uh, this uh, sort of adenoma has started developing, you know, adenomatous poly polyps, it's long and then it becomes big. Then we get KRAS mutation, we get severe dysplasia. It is not yet cancer, abnormal growth. Then we get another mutation, maybe P53 gene or uh, a mismatch repair gene or microsatellite instability. Now we have got a cancer. Okay, but this cancer is carcinoma in situ. It is above the basement membrane, but then it becomes an invasive cancer. It has gone through the basement membrane and submucosa and the muscle layer and through the serosa, it could go to other tissues as well. Okay. So this is how it pro progresses. And here is an example of an adenoma, right? This uh, is a pre-malignant. It is not a cancer, but it is a pre-malignant uh, lesion. So uh, what uh, maybe it has already been resected uh, by the surgeon. Now, etiology current research indicates that hereditary mutation of APC gene is the cause of familial adenomatous polyposis uh, which is a disease in which affected individuals carry an almost 100% risk of developing colon cancer by the age of 40 years. Now, these, this disease, familial adenomatous polyposis, obviously it is there because the person has inherited from his parents, his, he has inherited a mutation in the APC gene. Now, and you know, this person gets hundreds of small polyps in his colon. I will uh, show you the pictures, okay? So any one of these polyps can develop further mutations and it could transform itself in a cancer cell. Now, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, again, this is also hereditary. It comes uh, through the genes. It is also known as Lynch syndrome. Now, this poses a 40% lifetime risk. This is a 100% risk in, by the age of 40 years. So, so what do you do if you diagnose a person with familial adenomatous polyposis? What do you do? You just take out the whole colon, okay? This is a sort of a, pro, a prophylactic surgery. Uh, I mean, uh, if the patient agrees, okay? So this, uh, this other condition, which is known as HNPCC. This has a 40% lifetime risk of developing colorectal cancer. And uh, these individuals are also at a risk of developing urothelial cancers, which are in the bladder, and endometrial cancer in cases of females in the uterus. Epidemiological studies have linked increased risk of colorectal cancer to red meat and animal fat. And this thing is so common in uh, Saudi Arabia, people eat so much of meat and that too, you know, with a lot of fat. Low fiber diet, which means there are not enough vegetables, there are not enough fruits in the diet, and low overall intake of fruits and vegetables. And particularly, again, obesity is, is a risk factor, not only for colorectal cancer, but for many other cancers as well. And here is an example, you know, this familial adenomatous polyposis. You see this is uh, a resected colon and you see these are all polyps, polyps, you know. You count them, maybe you see about 50 in, the, in just this small little area. So these people get hundreds of polyps, okay? And this is a normal colon. You see, you see it is so neat and clean, sort of, and this uh, has got polyps in it. So what are the first symptoms of Lynch syndrome? Uh, Lynch syndrome, as I mentioned, is HNPCC hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer. And adenocarcinomas account for 90 to 95% of large bowel cancers. Okay. So I'll come to the signs and symptoms in the next slide. Let us complete etiology first obesity, cigarette smoking, alcohol consumption, and sedentary habits, which means doing no exercises, sitting all the day. These are the risk factors. Then again, genes um, 
WNT signaling pathways. Again, I said, you know, these are uh, strange uh, uh, names, you know, this, these names come, you know, this stands for wingless integrated, you know, wings are there in uh, flyers only. So this name comes from flyers, okay? Uh, which most often result from loss of APC plays a critical role in development of colorectal cancer. And this beta catenin is another gene uh, which mediates uh, the WNT pathway. So now what you have to understand is that there are certain genetic mutations which lead to impaired signaling pathways inside the cell and that leads to loss on cell cycle control, which means the cell will start dividing um, in an uncontrollable way. So this signaling, WNT and catenin B the signaling, also appears to be involved in obesity, glucose metabolism, and type 2 diabetes. Ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, these are inflammatory bowel disease. They increase the risk of adenocarcinoma particularly if the diseases have been there for a very long time, okay? Now, prognosis of colorectal cancer is, it is not as bad as lung cancer. But the five-year survival rate is 65%. You know, we saw that in lung cancer, it was just about 15 to 25%. So it is much, much better than uh, lung cancer. And... Uh, the five-year survival rate is inversely related to stage, which means if you diagnose the cancer at a higher stage, uh, then the survival is going to be low. So that is why you know we do screening, and I'll come to screening uh, in a little while. So our purpose is to diagnose the cancer at an early stage. If we diagnose the cancer at an early stage, we can do certain therapeutic interventions, um, to cure the cancer. So survival rate in, low, uh, rate in localized disease, localized disease means stage one and stage two disease. Uh, it is 90.2%, five year, very high survival rate. Regional disease, if, if, the, if the cancer has penetrated deeper into the, into the walls of the colon or it has gone to the lymph nodes or adjacent structures like peritoneum. Then um, it is a little bit low, but still very good, 71.8% five-year survival. Distant disease, obviously distant disease means metastasis, could be in the liver or the lungs or the bones, wherever. Then the survival is very low, just 14% for five years. In patients with colorectal liver metastasis, High number of T regulatory cells relative to CD, CD8 cells are predictive of uh, this uh, poor outcome, okay? So that is just uh, something for uh, prognosis. And I hope you know all about this T regulatory cells. These are the TH2 and TH1 helper cells, if you remember. Right, predictors of worse outcome, tumor size greater than five centimeter, disease-free survival less than one year, more than one tumor, okay? Uh, primary lymph node positivity, you know, lymph nodes are involved. The higher the number of lymph nodes involved, the poorer the prognosis. Carcinoembryonic antigen, you know, CAE stands for carcinoembryonic antigen. You know, if it is greater than 200 nanogram per ml, then the prognosis is bad. And you know, something similar we have in prostate cancer. In prostate cancer, we have got a prostate specific uh, antigen. If the level is very high, the prognosis is poor, okay, at the time of diagnosis. After we start the treatment, if the level falls down very rapidly, the lower it goes, the better the prognosis. So if you start treatment for colorectal cancer and the level of carcinoembryonic antigen falls down, then that will be a good sign, okay? So baseline level of circulating tumor cells less than three has a uh, longer survival. So in any type of cancer, we always find cancer cells circulating in the blood. 
So we can isolate them and then we can detect the cancer at an early stage. Now, prognosis, uh, I've left some blanks over here. So I want to ask you that with high BMI, do you think that the survival will be reduced or not? Question for you, so wake up if you're sleeping. With high BMI, there is a patient who comes to you with colorectal cancer and you find that his BMI is perhaps 32. So what do you think? His survival will be low or high? No answer? No, doctor. It will be low. That is very good. Yes. High BMI is an important predictor of reduced survival among patients with non-metastatic colorectal cancer. Increased recreational physical activity in patients activity in patients with colorectal carcinoma. Is that good or bad? So it reduces mortality, which means it is a good thing, okay? Use of aspirin, what do you think? Uh, some studies found that use of aspirin, I don't know whether it is good or bad, among known carriers, okay, of hereditary. So this means the patient is not a case of colorectal cancer. He's a carrier of some mutation, like APC mutation or HNPCC microsatellite instability or something like that. So is aspirin good or bad? What do you think? Well, it has good. Been, yes, it's been shown that aspirin is protective as a pro prophylactic uh, um, drug. But problem with aspirin is, you know, it is a blood thinner, it is an antiplatelet drug. Some people start getting GI bleeds and they might get blood with their stools, you know, and blood in stools is a very important test that we find that we do to, uh, to have some idea of colorectal cancer, you know. Uh, if you find uh, in a person who is aged above 50, 60 years and you find blood in his stools, it is known as occult blood, then you have to do further investigations for colorectal cancer. Patients with mental disorders, again, you know, patients with mental disorders will not go for treatment. And if they don't go, don't go for treatment, then obviously uh, the disease will not have a good prognosis. Then smoking and type two diabetes, I'm sure you know that these two things are not good they have got a higher mortality. Now let us go on to clinical presentation. Because of increased screening practices, colon cancer is now often detected before it starts to cause symptoms. And I'll show you the screening practices as well. Um, so common clinical presentation, we call them red flag uh, symptoms, okay? Iron deficiency anemia. Iron deficiency anemia means that the person has been bleeding from his GIT. Why would a person bleed from a GIT? Maybe he has an ulcer in the stomach. Maybe he has got a cancer in the colon. Maybe he has got inflammatory bowel disease, right? But we have to do further investigations because it is a red flag. Rectal bleeding, there are again many causes of rectal bleeding. Even polyps, which are not cancer, they can cause rectal bleeding. Hemorrhoids can cause like a rectal bleeding, right? Fissures can cause, but they are also very painful. And uh, cancers can cause rectal bleeding. Abdominal pain, vague pain on the left side or the right side of the abdomen, you know, that they could be um, a present clinical presentation. Changed bowel habits, which means going to bathroom. The habits have changed. That is another possible sign. Intestinal obstruction or perforation, that is a bad sign. You know, if a patient of colorectal cancer comes to you with intestinal obstruction, with severe pain and with distension of the abdomen, or perforation means that um, there is a hole in the intestine and he will develop peritonitis. And after that, if you diagnose colorectal cancer, then it has a bad prognosis. So right-sided lesions, which means after the cecum, if you remember the anatomy, they are associated with younger age and common presenting signs include bleeding or diarrhea. And in these type of cancers, 
you very commonly have microsatellite instability. Left-sided tumor are associated with old age and uh, patients commonly present with bowel obstruction. So this is not a good sign and they're also related to uh, development of uh, adenomas, which have converted to cancer. You know, I sh showed you the stepwise mutations in the genes, they more commonly occur in the left side uh, tumors, okay, descending colon. Right, in patients more than 50 years of age, pain is the most common symptoms. Other red flag symptoms are less common, so abdominal pain is more common. But remember, a very important test is stool for occult blood, hidden blood. You cannot see, but you can do a test in the lab. So this, you see a big cancer in the colon, it will cause obstruction, it, or if it becomes a little bit bigger, it will cause obstruction, and it's going to cause pain as well, okay? So again, it's pretty big cancer over here, right? And rectal bleeding, iron deficiency, anemia, intestinal obstruction, abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, all of these could occur in this cancer. Now let us go on to uh, our investigations and workup. Screening plays a major role in diagnosis of curable cancer, cancerous lesions. Okay, the guidelines from American College of Gastroenterology, they recommend colonoscopy every 10 years. For everyone, they want them to do a colonoscopy, which is putting a camera through the rectum into the sigmoid, then the ascending colon, okay? Uh, but you cannot take it too far. But in any way, there we have got some other ways of diagnosing that as well. So after 50 years, you have to do it every 10 years, which means 50 years, 60 years, or uh, at the age of 70 years. Uh, but there are some other tests as well. A rectal examination and colonoscopy with biopsy of suspicious lesions is recommended. For example, if the person, if the doctor does a colonoscopy and he sees a polyp over there, he can take a biopsy, small little tissue. If he sees an ulcer, he can take a small biopsy and check that in the, uh, or check that with the pathologist to see if it's a cancer. Right, so um, this uh, National Cancer Network, whatever, recommends that diagnosed colorectal patient cancer patients below age 70 be tested for HNPCC syndrome or Lynch syndrome, all right? Uh, profuse bleeding and obstruction require emergency surgery. And functional status that we discussed in previous lecture, which is the level of activities of the patient, comorbidities like type 2 diabetes or some other diseases that, uh, that can cause a problem during surgery, so they should also be assessed. Right, workup uh, work and blood studies. Uh, blood studies are done with the goal of assessing organ function before therapeutic procedure. So, you know, therapeutic, one of the therapeutic procedures is a surgery that is uh, the first thing we think of if it's an early stage cancer or localized disease, that's what we call it. Then we have to look at many other things. We have to look at kidney function. We have to look at lung function, which we have to look at hemoglobin of the patient, okay? So we do a complete blood count. We do serum chemistries electrolytes and um, uh, metabolic panel, you, you can include that. We do liver function test, renal function test, and carcinoembryonic antigen that I explained to you. A baseline for carcinoembryonic antigen, this is an important point. And we do the same for um, a prostate cancer that we will do next, okay? So they should be obtained preoperatively as it is. it carries prognostic values when highly elevated level may indicate more advanced disseminated disease. So prognostic value is if you find very high levels in the beginning at the time of diagnosis, then the prognosis is not good. And when you start treatment and the levels fall down, that means your treatment is working, all right? Uh, serum chemistries include BUN, creatinine, which are kidney function test, glucose, obviously, this is a test for diabetes, sodium, potassium, chloride, carbon dioxide for, for the lungs, okay? Um, 
and carcinoembryonic antigen is not included in staging guidelines, okay? So that doesn't help over there. For staging, we have got other things for doing staging, all right? So uh, we will stop here for another 10 minutes. You take a break and then come back after 10 minutes, all right? So the next uh, slide is imaging studies. Uh, just like any other cancer, we do blood studies, we do blood chemistries, we do studies for certain biomarkers for the cancers, and we do imaging studies as well. And these imaging studies are more or less the same in most of the cancers, right? Uh, so adequate in imaging of chest and abdomen should be obtained for staging purposes. And ideally, we do that preoperatively. Uh, we can do an abdominal or pelvic or chest CT scan. We can do a contrast ultrasound. We can do a contrast MRI, a CT scan. We can do that for abdomen and the liver as well. Abdominal or pelvic MRI scans for abdomen and liver, okay? Uh, we can do a chest radiograph or a chest CT scan. Barium anima is an um, important exam to delineate the primary lesion preoperatively. A positron emission tomography, we have seen that before in <clears throat> breast cancer and also in lung cancer. So there are this equipment or the apparatus or the machine is very expensive, but uh, this is a very good test, okay? And sometimes it is combined with a CT scan, which is known as fusion PET, CT, or it could be combined with MRI as well. And that's the field of the radiologist. Now, caution of using a signet ring cell variant of mm, colorectal cancer may not be well visualized on a PET scan, but obviously we have got, we can do biopsies as well to find out these things, okay? Right, again, um, in US, in early stages, uh, the survival rate is 90% if the cancer is found and treated early, which is a very good thing. Uh, when should you start screening? The purpose of screening is to detect the cancer at an early stage and then to treat it. The screening, if the person has got no risk, no familial risk, okay, then the screening should start at the age of 50 years. And the screening test we do is, uh, that is uh, colonoscopy, okay? So most guidelines recommend average risk individual to start screening at age 50 and the and colonoscopy um, is the test of choice that we do, okay? Now, in screening, a joint guideline, guideline was developed by American Cancer Society uh, and by the Preventive Task Force and, and American College of uh, Radiology. And they're based, based on individual risk factors we have already said that a person with average risk factors, uh, uh, it should start at the age of 50 years. He doesn't have uh, this disease, adenomatous polyposis coli, which uh, is basically a, a PC mutation. He does not have uh, Lynch syndrome, which is HNPCC. So that's a normal average patient. We should start colonoscopy at the age of 50 years. Uh, because of the rising rates of CRC in younger patients, screening should be at the age of 45 at average risk. Well, it's up to the person, it's up to your insurance company, it's up to the doctor when he wants to start screening, but mostly it is 50 years that is recommended by most of the guidelines. And the screening tests include flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is done every five years. Well, whatever you age you start at, if you start at 50, then every five years, 45, again, every five years. Colonoscopy is done every 10 years, double contrast, barium anima every five years, and CT colonography also uh, every five years. Okay, so these are the different types of screening tests that we can employ. Uh, indications for colonoscopy, if there is a family history 
of colorectal cancer or polyps, then we have to start screening at an earlier stage, at a younger age. Family history of hereditary colorectal cancer syndrome, uh, such as familial adenomatous polyposis or HNPCC. Again, you know, this is an indication for early colonoscopy. Personal history of colorectal cancer, which has been treated and the patient is in remission. To find out the recurrence, we have to do colonoscopy. Uh, chronic inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, you know, there we have to do colonoscopy. Unfortunately, you know, in these diseases, uh, we, we cannot do a stool test because we find a little bit of bleeding in the colon with these diseases and we can find occult blood in stools in these diseases. Otherwise, occult uh, blood in stools is a very good test uh, for colorectal cancer. So tests that primarily detect cancer and the, and the recommended frequency include the following. Uh, so this is the test, you know, occult blood test, guaiac, annual guaiac-based fecal. You know, guaiac is a chemical that detects blood. Occ occult means it cannot be seen, okay? So it will only be detected when the stool is treated with guaiac, okay? With high test sensitivity for cancer. Annual fecal immunohistochemical test. This also has got a high sensitivity for cancer. Stool DNA test because the cancer cells, they are found in the school stools as well. So they could be done every one to three years, okay? Screening should start at a younger age and should be more frequent in high-risk individuals, such as, such as persons with any of the following. Uh, prior history of polyps, family history of colorectal cancer. The person has a prior history of colorectal cancer and history of inflammatory bowel disease. And it's the same thing that I mentioned in the previous slide. Again, um, uh, they say that colonoscopy is the gold standard. And uh, this slide is also just for your reference. Uh, what it is saying is that if you diagnose the cancer early, which is stage one and stage two, and maybe stage three as well, then the uh, five-year survival rate is about 90%. And this is a special test, which is known as uh, Cologuard. It is a colorectal cancer screening test, detects DNA mutations and hemoglobin in stool samples, right? So mutations you always do through a PCR. So this is one specific test and the other is uh, colonoscopy. And again, this is also for your reference, it gives you the sensitivity and specificities for different screening tests that we have, okay? And it also gives you negative and positive predictive values. Uh, and But I'll not go into any more details of this slide. Right, then we have got, uh, you know, another way which is known as capsule colonoscopy. There is a camera that is uh, enclosed in a capsule that the person can swallow and it will go through the entire GIT and it will be uh, recovered from the stools that the person passes, right? So the patient swallows a pill camera that acquires images as peristalsis propels it through the gastrointestinal tract. The images are transmitted to a recording device and then converted to a video format for viewing on a computer. So it takes the pill in and he has a belt on which this recording device um, is attached, okay? In 2014, the US FDA approved pill cam, colon capsule endoscopy system. Okay, there, there are many available. This is one from Israel. So this is a pill cam, you know, it has cameras on both sides. A pill cam, this is another one, it has camera on one side only. And this uh, is for your reference, it gives, gives some detail how you, you take or ingest that pill cam. You have to be empty stomach and, you know, fasting is necessary and so many things. So you can read it on your own, okay? It has, it's giving the sizes of the pill as well. So this is for your reference if you want to go into more detail. And here are a few pictures which have been taken by a pill cam. And you can see that the pill cam has 
given the pictures of polyps or it could be a cancer as well, whatever it is. So the next step would be to take a biopsy, do CT scans and uh, identify the location of this uh, area. And then uh, we can do further investigations, okay? And this pill cam has taken a picture of, a, of an intestinal worm, which is tinea saginata, okay? So pill cam is a useful thing. So, so we have so many different tests. We have colonoscopy and fiber optic apparatus, stool test. We have got imaging modalities. We do blood chemistries and many blood tests, baseline tests for carcinoembryonic antigen. And then we have to do molecular testing as well. Uh, testing of metastatic colorectal cancer is increasingly guided by molecular testing of the tumor. We look for RAS mutation, okay? The RAS gene is an important gene. We said that K-RAS mutation is most of the times included in the stepwise progression of colorectal cancer. So RAS mutational testing, we test for EGFR gene as well. Uh, then BRAF is another V600. This is just the position of the amino acid where the, we find the mutation. Okay, we have got a special uh, specific drug if you find this mutation, okay, in conjunction with deficient mismatch repair or microsatellite instability. So these are the molecular tests we are doing at the DNA level. Again, this is deficient uh, mismatch repair. You know what is mismatch repair? If there is any mutation in the DNA, the DNA polymerase immediately repairs that mutation. Let us suppose that we insert a wrong nucleotide when the DNA is being uh, polymerized or replicated. The, uh, the DNA polymerase will detect that. It will excise the wrong nucleotide and put the right nucleotide in that place. So that is what we mean by mismatch repair. And when there is a problem in mismatch repair, then obviously mutations cannot be repaired, all right? So we perform these tests. So what are these tests? We have done it for RAS mutation. We have done it for EGFR. We have done it for BRAF gene. We have done it for microsatellite instability and mismatch repair genes in Lynch syndrome patients, okay? Now we go on to the staging of colorectal cancer. And I think after staging, we will stop and then we will come back to this lecture next week. So again, we have seen that we have PNM staging system in breast cancer, we have PNM staging system in lung cancer, and we have PNM staging system in colorectal cancer as well. So this has become the international standard for staging of colorectal cancer. T means the size of the primary tumor or its depth into the bowel wall, how deeply has it penetrated. So I'll show you the different layers just to remind you of the, uh, of the histology of colorectal cancer. Then we look at the number of lymph nodes that are involved. And then we also look at the metastasis of uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, so here is um, a, a diagram of your uh, of your intestine, we have the same layers everywhere in the intestine, small intestine, large intestine. The inner, innermost layer is known as mucosa. Then we have uh, submucosa. And um, after that, uh, you know, we have uh, the, we have some nerve plexuses in between. We have two muscle layers, inner circular and outer longitudinal layer, all right? And then we have got the outermost layer, which is mostly fibrous tissue. It is known as serosa. And we have got two nerve plexuses, submucosal, which is the inner nerve plexus. You know, GIT has got its own nervous system. It is It works independently, right? It doesn't need in, any input from the brain. Even though it does have connections with sympathetic and particularly parasympathetic nervous system, but they can only increase or decrease the activity of the, of the intrinsic uh, nervous system of the GIT. 
So we have got a submucosal plexus and we have got a myenteric plexus. The submucosal plexus is related to secretions of the GIT and myenteric plexus is connected to the movements, the peristalsis and the opening and closure, closing of the sphincters, all right? Okay, and these are the layers, you know, because I said that the depth of bowel wall penetration, when we look at the tumor size, we see how deeply it has gone. So we have got a mucosa and we have got a submucosa and we have got a circular muscle layer and a longitudinal muscle layer and a serosa. So the cancer will start here somewhere in the epithelial cells and it will go deep and we see how deep it has gone. Maybe it has gone deeply, it has penetrated serosa and it has gone out into the peritoneum, okay? So keep this thing in mind. And this is uh, another close up view. These are the cells. Usually the cancer arises from these epithelial cells and it is known as adenocarcinoma, uh, which means that first it will turn into an adenoma. And we have got uh, this lamina propria, and this is a crypt of the uh, large intestine, okay? We have done this in uh, pathophysiology as well. You, if you remember in uh, ulcerative colitis, we find crypt abscesses in these crypt. Right? So um, in staging of the colorectal cancer, we look at the size of the tumor, how deeply has the tumor penetrated into the walls of the bowel, we look at the number of lymph nodes that are involved, whether lymph nodes are involved or not. And the last thing is metastasis, whether it has gone to the liver, to the lungs, to the brain, to the bones or wherever it goes, okay? So this is showing you the progression, you know, and this progression is related to the stepwise mutations in the genes. So maybe initially, the mutation is only in the APC gene, which is a tumor suppressive gene. So we get a polyp or an adenoma. Then it increases KRAS mutation, P53. And you see that the tumor is becoming larger and larger. Number one thing that you notice over here is that the size of the tumor is increasing. The second thing that you notice is that this tumor is above the basement membrane or lamina propria. This tumor has penetrated into the submucosa and also into the muscular layer. This tumor has reached the serosa, okay? It has penetrated both, both the muscle layers. This one has penetrated only circular muscle layer. And you see this cancer has penetrated through the serosa, okay? These are the different layers. So as, the, and we are looking at the tumor size, T1. So it goes from T1 to T2 to T3, T3, T4, and we have got further subdivisions, right? And I will not go through these uh, slides, but this is giving you all the details of different T1, T2, T3, T4A, T4B, different sizes of the tumor um, and how deeply they have penetrated, whether they have invaded the peritoneum or not, okay? So it is giving you all those details. It is giving you details about the lymph nodes. Uh, again, it is giving you details about metastasis, right? Um, C stands for clinical and P stands for pathological. Uh, and then uh, it gives you the stages as well. Stage zero, stage one, uh, stage 2A, stage 2B, stage 2C, right? Uh, so it, it uh, is telling you that what is the size of the tumor, how many lymph nodes are involved, or whether the metastasis is present or not, okay? So stage three, metastasis, you know, it's, it remains M0, no metastasis until uh, the third stage. And you see the stages are further subdivided into A, B, C, and A, B, C, and finally, we get metastasis, okay, to one organ, to more than one organ, whatever it is. But all these slides are for your reference when you go to your uh, oncology clinic, you can come back to my lecture and you can refer to these stages, all right? Uh, okay, so here are the pictures. Once again, this tumor, this is this inside the intestine and this is outside, you know, this is towards the peritoneal cavity. So this is the mucosa. Here you have got food, 
inside here. This is a tumor. It has gone into the submucosa. The submucosa has got blood vessels and Pyers patches, you know, the immune patches, then circular muscle layer, longitudinal muscle layer, and serosa. So this is what we see how the, this is stage one. It has just gone into the submucosa and no lymph nodes. You know, the lymph nodes are clear, right? And that is how we go. You can take a look at this yourself. You know, stage 2A, it is going deeper. It has crossed the serosa. Maybe it is involving the nearby organ, the peritoneum over here. You see, this uh, is visceral involvement of visceral peritoneum, right? So this is how the stage increases. And we are start getting the involvement of lymph nodes as well in stage three. And the number of lymph nodes are increasing, you know, two lymph nodes, maybe five or six lymph nodes. And then it becomes a little bit complicated because then it becomes a combination of the tumor size, its penetration into the bowel wall and the number of lymph nodes involved. So, but what you have to understand is that we are looking at the tumor size, its penetration, involvement of the per peritoneum or the nearby structure in the abdomen and the number of lymph nodes that are involved. And eventually we get metastasis, uh, which, is, uh, which is the cancer cells going to other tissues like the liver or uh, the bones. Okay, and this again, it is giving me the stages and the description of the stages. Again, uh, we will not include this thing in the examination. This is just for your reference uh, at later stages when you go to your, uh, uh, to the hospitals, to your internship, all right? So I'm quickly skipping through this. Now, we will just do the prognostic factors and see if there is anything else. We will not discuss treatment in this lecture. We'll do treatment in the next lecture. So let's look at the prognos prognostic factors associated with staging. So in addition to the well-established standard pathological features, uh, such as TNM, there are several other factors that are involved. Now, these include uh, lymph nodes, the number of lymph nodes, histologic grade, and lymphovascular perineural involving the nerves, <laughs> involving the lymphatic systems and the blood vessels, okay? So these things are also uh, taken into account when we are looking at the prognosis of the disease. Now, features of worse, worse prognosis, bile obstruction I've mentioned earlier, Ulcerative growth pattern, you know, uh, I hope you understand formation of an ulcer, erosions on the, on the mucosal layer of the bowel, okay, large bowel. Perforation is a bad sign. The elevated preoperative at the time of diagnosis of carcinoma embryonic antigen levels are more than 200. That's a bad sign. Then we have got molecular prognostic, prognostic factor. They are not routinely investigated. Uh, so P53 mutations, loss of heterozygosity, uh, mutations in DCC gene, mutation in e EGFR, epidermal growth factor receptor gene, okay? And this is just clinically important mutations. One is KRAS. Uh, there is a special PCRSA for this mutation, okay? Then D this deficient and mismatch repair, and uh, high frequency microsatellite instability. It's all genetics and because you have not done genetics. So you can keep this for your reference only. I'll not test this in your examination. Just this is a, for diagnosing these, um, this particularly KRAS mutation. You have got this special kit, which is a PCR kit, all right? And uh, prognostic factor for five-year relapse-free survival, uh, for patients aged 60 to 69 years uh, with selected stage T3 or T4 tumor size uh, prognostic factor and five-year relapse free survival based on Mayo Clinic calculator. So what I'm telling you over here is, in this slide is, and again, it's, it is for your reference only, there is a calculator which has been developed by the Mayo Clinic in the USA. And you can calculate actually the prognosis. Again, you have to give some information to the calculator and it will give you the prognosis 79% or 30% of 
how I mean 73% survival in how many years, okay? So uh, I think uh, we do have time. Uh, so we will go until we come to the treatment. We will keep going. Histologic subtypes and metastatic patterns. Uh, this is again a slide for your reference only. This Dutch study was done on uh, 1,675 patients. Uh, there are different subtypes of histologic subtypes. Um, mucinous adenocarcinoma, signet ring cell carcinoma. We find signet ring cells in stomach cancers as well. Adenocarcinoma. Uh, and then, you know, I will not again go into these details because, you know, we are basically um, interested in the treatment and therapeutics of cancer. So this is just for your reference. And here is the slide for treatment. And I'm going to stop here because we'll, we will go to treatment uh, in the next lecture, all right? And if you have any questions so far, you can ask me or you can send me uh, email. You can ask on WhatsApp as well. Okay, so if there is no question, then I'm going to stop the recording over here and I'll see you next time.